The clock is ticking with just seven weeks to go until Brexit D-Day. D, standing for deal or no deal? Because unless an agreement can be reached in the coming weeks, Britain will crash out of the EU without a deal. Prime Minister Theresa May has been in Brussels this week for more negotiations. But if anything, the EU is becoming more hard-lined, with Donald Tusk saying there was a special place in hell for those who promoted Brexit without a plan while the President of the European Parliament said a no-deal Brexit would be an economic and human catastrophe. And yesterday, the Governor of the Bank of England warned that a no-deal could lead to recession in the UK and said the fog of Brexit is causing short-term volatility in economic data and more fundamentally, it's creating a series of tensions in the economy, tensions for business. So, will a deal be cobbled together at the last minute, or will the UK leave without an agreement? Will there be an extension of the deadline? And what does all this mean for the UK economy? Well, joining us now around the table is Simon French, Chief Economist at Pamela Gordon, and also Robert Ault, Director of the Bruges Group. Thanks very much, both of you, for joining us. Pleasure. Let's start with you both um, telling me where you think we are in this uh, debate, um, in the deal or no deal situation, and where you think we might get to um, over the next seven weeks. Robert, let's start with you. Well, no deal is a misnomer. There is actually no such thing as no deal. We either leave with the withdrawal agreement, a version of that which Theresa May has uh, negotiated, or we leave with other deals which the EU has already uh, announced that would be there in case the withdrawal agreement, as is been proved, doesn't get through Parliament or the, even the European Parliament. The EU has already agreed it would have unlimited haulage access, flights would continue, uh, the movement of radioactive isotopes. There are a whole host of areas where the European Union has said, uh, OK, yep, things will carry on pretty much as they are at the moment. Of course, with some changes, of course, but either we have the withdrawal agreement or we have a series of other deals. There is no such thing as no deal and there is no such thing as crashing out of the European Union. Of course, we also have other bodies, international bodies, that would keep trade open once we're outside of the European Union, not just the WTO, a whole host of international organisations and agreements that the European Union has made and the UK has also signed up to. So either we leave with the withdrawal agreement or we leave with other deals which are already pretty much in place. So everything will be fine, more or less, once we're outside of the European Union. Everything will continue. We're going out on the 29th of March at 11pm and we should be looking forward to a world of opportunity that we're going into. A misnomer, do you agree with that, Simon? Uh, look, I, I'm probably not going to get into a, an argument on how what you define uh, leaving without what is tabled as the withdrawal deal. Uh, the, the, the counterweight to that is if you don't have a withdrawal deal in a transition period, then some of the concerns that we're seeing in the economic data will only magnify from here. And I say that because one of the things that underpinned Donald Tusk's uh, comments, which were quite inflammatory, probably didn't help, was the fact that from the very outset of this process, economic actors, businesses, households have tried to get some clarity on what is going to happen and they've really struggled to do that. And I don't think it, without, a, with a tr without a transition period in place that they get that level of clarity and have to make the kind of snap decisions on the 29th of March, which they're not set up to do. Will everything be fine, though, come the 30th of March, well, as Robert says? Sorry, well, go well, on. So, so one thing I would say, and this is kind of uh, perhaps um, underreported, is the fact that there are policy levers that the government can pull, the Bank of England can pull, in terms of leaning against any economic disruption. Uh, look, you're right to say that the uh, there will be in the short term, some of the existing ways that the UK trades with the European Union will be rolled over. But those will be time limited and businesses are forward looking. They will recognise that those transition um, processes will come to an end. And once that happens, they're going to have to add frictions into their cost of doing business. Robert, you look like you wanted to come in on that. Well, you quoted from Mark Carney, the <laughs> Governor of the Bank of England. When are we going to stop listening to Mark Carney? He has a prestigious title. He, uh, Governor of the Bank of England, involved with a whole host of other international organisations, which I, I think is driving his agenda. We know that the Bank of England don't actually believe their own predictions. They're making things seem a lot worse than what they would actually be. We know that actually the economy, the data, is actually the purchase managers index is up. The economy is growing in this but country. Isn't that because people are, as they say, <laughs> hoarding again because they're uncertain of what it's going to be like come March the 30th? Well, <laughs> 
OK, well now we're blaming the growing economy on Brexit. We've had all kinds of fake problems blamed upon Brexit. When are we actually going to recognise that really the economy didn't perform ever so badly when we voted to leave the opinion, as Mark Carney predicted, it went on a period of growth. Our exports are up as well. Purchase Managers Index up, employment up, and now at record levels, our unemployment down. You know, it's the but European never... Union that's in crisis, it's the Germany that is going into recession, Italy in recession. Paris, riots on the streets every weekend. I thought the City of London was going to re relocate to Paris. No, it's never going to happen. Basically, we're talking the about the UK and the impact on the UK. You know, at the moment, that's what the people of the UK are concerned about, and that's what businesses are concerned about. Well, the businesses would not be employing more people if they were ever so concerned about how the economy is going to perform. Businesses, I think, are relocating in terms of where they're sending their exports. They are sending now more abroad outside of the European Union to the rest of the world. We are really refocusing the focus of this country. We are going global country and that's where we are headed and this is where according to the IMF 90% of global growth in the future will be outside of the European Union. That's where we need to refocus, that's where we need to be exporting, that's where we need to be making our trade deals. The European Union is in going from crisis to crisis. We need to get away from that, otherwise we will be on hook for their debts. We've already had to pay countless billions before, uh, some of which we've already been paid back. But the next economic shock that hits the European Union, which is already underway, if we're still in the European Union, we will be paying for that. It, it's the prudent thing to be getting out and getting out now. Getting out, getting out now. Our growth is absolutely fine. So, so I wouldn't disagree with the opportunities that present themselves in third party countries outside the European Union. But unfortunately, the economic analysis suggests that being a member of the customs union is of no inhibitor at all. It isn't stopping uh, the French, the Germans, the Italians going to India, going to China and doing trade deals. There's this, there's this myth that has been allowed to emerge that for some, some element of being a member of the European Union precludes our ability to do really profitable trade relationships with areas that are going to be high growth over the next 20, 30 years. It just simply doesn't stand up to scrutiny. And that's the problem that I have with the analysis, is this promise that you must have one or the other. You can absolutely have both. And there's some very successful exporting countries in the European Union that are doing that. I think the UK should embrace well, there's, that. Well, there's Germany, which uh, is essentially a currency manipulator, taking advantage of the low-valued euro to not only dominate the markets of other eurozone states, but also gain competitive advantages when exporting to the United States or indeed to China. Uh, so well, much I mean, for, so much for the, concerned about that. Well, so yeah. much for the Treasury's gravity <laughs> model when Germany's biggest uh, trade partner is China. That's because, of course, they make Germany makes good products and has the euro. But Britain isn't in that position. We do not have a, well, uh, such a low valued uh, currency that's co uh, uncompetitive uh, for other nations and helping, helping our economy to grow. That's actually been the benefit of the pound falling, but actually the pound is probably undervalued at the moment and will no doubt rise as we go forward. But so Britain you think that it will rise? Brexit happens, no deal? Well, as you say, no deal's a misnomer, but we, a hard Brexit, we don't, the pound actually strengthens? Well, I think the, the pound is undervalued. The pound before was overvalued. Uh, George, George Osborne, as Chancellor of the Exchequer, said the pound needs to fall. That's what he said in 2015. Then when, of course, the pound falls, that's meant to be some kind of crisis. This has helped drive our exports. And it will probably, the pound will go up. We have at the moment algorithms that are reading newspaper articles that are programmed to sell pounds at lower levels than they would otherwise be sold at if, indeed, uh, there, there is suggestions of there being uh, what they call a no deal, which is actually, as I mentioned earlier, a misnomer. This is all really human inputs into a system to create false scenarios, and the pound, I think, will actually rise when, of course, they see on... OK, I, I be, have to bring I'm, I mean, I'm very, I'm very happy to take the other side of that, <laughs> bet, bet, because uh, the pound won't rise in the into case of... Long the, term no, no, the, will. The, the pound won't. I'm telling you right now, speak to international investors on a daily basis. They will look at a departure from the European Union without a deal put in place as putting in a period of heightened uncertainty which will probably 
result in more frictions to doing trade with the UK. And you must price that in terms of how you're pricing UK assets. You must look at those potential frictions and put a discount on. So if we're doing fundamental analysis of the value of sterling for international investors, they are going to mark that down on the idea that there are going to be more frictions to trade going forward than there are under the status quo of being in the European Union. And in the long term, when we see, I'm not talking about the, in the run-up when we see that there, there won't be this withdrawal agreement going through, although I suspect that actually many Labour MPs will end up voting for it and some version of the withdrawal agreement will possibly get through, even how undesirable that may, may well be. But when, of course, people realise uh, from the 1st of April onwards that actually things are fine, the sky didn't fall in, that Mark Carney and the Treasury have been wrong again, then they'll realise that, wait a minute, this economic catastrophe isn't happening. In fact, the economic catastrophe is in Germany and thankfully we're no longer going to have to be paying for their bailing out their financial system. Well, what you're saying... Then the pound will inevitably <laughs> rise if indeed I am right that basically the economy in the UK continues to grow. If it is as straightforward as you kind of implying it is, why then is there so much uncertainty and why every time we hear a tweet or we, we hear someone speaking, do we see such volatility then in the well, markets it's, it's, in the past? It's, it's for political reasons. The, so is it then the, that we've seen a, such a turnaround in politics driving economics and now that we've seen such a switch in well, it. Well, we have people applying a theory, and the f if the facts don't fit the theory, then we must disregard the facts, and you must stick with the theory. That is the European Union approach. It's, uh, the reality is, is that Great Britain, the United Kingdom, has the fastest, sef fastest growing economy in Europe amongst the G7 countries. The, the evidence is there, and this is with this uncertainty and all these economic problems that you say exist, which no one can actually name. No one can actually name these problems. If, we're, if there's actually produced evidence, name the companies that are laying people off. Name the purchase managers that are not ordering, that are... That are it, it's it's yeah. theory dri and politics driving e public discourse and economic discussion when the facts say... But it's uncertainty because at the moment there is no agreement. Well, just, that's just, well, well when, when we see the economy okay. growing, continue okay. to grow once we're out of the European Union with or without the withdrawal agreement, then hopefully rational heads will return mm. and people will start looking at data again okay. rather than applying theory and actually just echoing groupthink. OK, Simon? I mean, one of the problems here is the time to assess on what the impact of Brexit has been will probably be in the best part of a decade's time when we understand what the migration regime looks like in the UK economy going forward, what the trading relationship looks like, what those free trade deals do in terms of facilitating trade versus the costs of not having regulatory harmonisation with what will remain for many, many years to come, our biggest trading bloc, which is the European Union. And we do not know that now. So unfortunately, a lot of the data that has been reeled off which I grant you has been uh, relatively upbeat over the last two and a half years. It's not the right time to do a post-mortem. We have absolutely no idea what... Oh, no, 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 let me finish. We simply do not know what the frictions look like, even seven weeks out from the time which we we're expected to depart the European Union. And therefore, businesses can't make final decisions around relocations. Businesses and investors can't price in those frictions because they, like the rest of us, just simply do not know. So, unfortunately, looking at the data of the last two and a half years provides not a jot of insight as to what the impact of Brexit will be. Well, so, OK, we have a situation where if there is a negative, uh, negative information, negative arguments about the impact of Brexit, then that is gospel, then that is taken, that gets media coverage. If, of course, actually you can look at evidence that says that everything will be fine and, and theory that everything will be fine and will we'll actually succeed, well, actually, that, you can't take that information because we just don't no, it seems that you're really emphasising the, the negatives, which is actually very disappointing because you would know that uh, from, from your field of occupation you should always be looking for opportunities mm -hmm. and there would always be an opportunity. Look at how the, since the Brexit referendum, the pound had, did fall in value and look at the great opportunity that created for the FTSE 100 index. Well, let's look at opportunities then, Simon. So, that, that, so we should okay. not be, we should not be right, down, so we should be confident, so we should be UK, buccaneering. UK companies have devalued... Okay, no, UK no, yeah, companies Simon. have devalued 30% versus the global mm. benchmark since the Brexit date. And bear in mind, UK companies used to re-rate in line with global equities 
and D-rate, they have decoupled on an unprecedented amount. I can go back 50, 60 years worth of data and you cannot find a period of time when international investors are so bearish about the UK economy. Now, to be consistent... We have the highest opportunity for direct investment. To be, to be consistent... Look, we have the highest let's foreign, be very, we have record let's levels be, of foreign let's be, direct investment. Let's, let's be very clear. This is bearish. Let's be, they are bearish because what is coming, not as what is past. You keep mentioning. Why are people you investing? Know, it, it, the reality is, you have, what is coming in your theory? When the reality is, we have the second highest my, FDI in the world apart from China. We have record levels of foreign direct investment. The evidence is there. We will actually be doing far much better outside of the European Union. Mm -hmm. But OK, so I think Simon agreed with you that actually looking outside the EU is what we should be Absolutely, doing. We've, yeah. we've had that agreement. Can, we, can yeah. we look at opportunities then? You mentioned the fact that we shouldn't be negative. We should, OK, this is happening in some form. There are opportunities. What are the opportunities then? Simon, opportunity, what opportunities well, do you see? Well, so, so I wouldn't diverge at all from the opportunities you've laid out in terms of the growth opportunities of forging better trading relationships with non-EU countries. But my challenge as, a, as an economist looking at this is that we have not had an active industrial strategy or a trading strategy in the UK economy for the last 30, 40 years. That is a failure of domestic legislation and domestic political priorities. It's not a failure that was made in Brussels. It's not a constraint provided to us by EU law or the ECJ. This is the frustration, which is the very opportunities that I want to see the UK go after, and neither enabled to a greater extent by, by leaving the European Union, or indeed constrained by its ongoing membership. There is the, uh, the problem with this whole debate. Actually, you are nodding your head to Simon there, which is good to see. So for you, are you in agreement in those opportunities? Where, where do you want to see it going? Well, we need to be exporting more. Coming out of the European Union is helping us rebalance our economy. And you know, many manufacturers in the UK, from Lord Bamford of JCB to Dyson, people that produce, people, entrepreneurs that actually create things and export, they actually want us to leave the European Union because we think we can do a lot better ourselves. There's evidence to suggest that uh, countries outside of the EU have done better with their trade deals and managed to increase their exports through uh, making these deals themselves than the ones created for them by as members of the European Union so really we can do a lot better but so Simon's right we do need this industrial policy we do need a do need a, a strategy but the European Union has been hampering that arguably with their with regulations that many people feel and what we've seen is when we became members of the European Union we shedded millions of jobs in the UK we used to have a balance a trade balance with the EU now we have a massive trade deficit which our membership quite high interest rates as well. Our membership of the European Union, well, that came down as a result of the, the, the global um, uh, changes to, to, to inflation with uh, uh, wi raised, rising number of workers and keeping lo wages lower. Uh, but, but of course, just to come back to my point, we sh basically, the European Union has been, or our membership of the European Union has been very good for producers on the continent, not so good for those in the UK, where we've actually then basically importing so much from uh, other countries in the European Union. Um, so a recession with a no deal, well, we, I know you say, Ms Noma, is not on the cards for you. Well, the recession's going to be in Germany, and, uh, and in the UK. which it already no, is, UK, arguably, UK and recession, Italy. not on the cards. Mark Carney's wrong there. Of course, he was wrong before he's wrong okay. again. Why, why do people listen to him? He's, he's got an agenda, so which, he, which he can't or won't state publicly. But he's involved with all these meetings in Davos. He sees himself as part of the, the global elite, and he really has damaged his, uh, his copybook, really, in terms of making these false statements and being far too close to, to politics. But... He, okay. he, he's really not okay. someone we need to be listening to in the UK. It's, it's very disappointing, but the former Chancellor, the former uh, Governor of the Bank of England, Mervyn King, pro-withdrawal, he can see the opportunities. OK, it's, Simon... I mean, Mark Carney, it's his master's voice, really. He was smiling throughout that, yeah. not exactly smiling with well, Robert, but smiling. Well, so, if, again, you go back to the people uh, we speak to on a daily basis, they see Mark Carney as the one grown-up economic policy maker in the UK economy at the moment. If you look at the way that Westminster has behaved over the last two and a half years, actually it's in sharp contrast to the way the Bank of England have, have behaved both in the immediate aftermath to the, the referendum... He's been and, continually and, wrong. And 
But hang on, one of the challenges, as you well know, is that uh, economic forecasts, I'm not going to get into a battle on who's been right and who's been wrong. He's been wrong, fact. (laughs) Yeah, but but, but, uh, economic economic forecast, he's an economic steward. Mm. And the decision to cut interest rates, to restart quantitative easing that provided some short-term support to the UK economy... Which is now seen as a mistake. was sensible, was sensible, sensible policy making. Overreaction. Sensible policy making. Sensible policy making. Okay, let's just let Simon finish. That's he fine. let you that's finish. Right. Oh, that's your perspective. Yeah. And you're no, entitled. That, that, that's you're why entitled. it's widely, you're widely you're accepted. Entitled. You're, entitled. Simon, you're, entitled. Okay. you're entitled. Okay. To your, you're entitled to your perspective. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying. I'm what saying he most did, people would agree what, with me that after the referendum, his quantitative easing was, was, was unwarranted. But, it was just, but what it did is it provided support to the UK economy. It provided at a time when there was a vacuum. Uh, no, there was a there was a vac there was a vacuum okay. at the top political leadership, and I think at the moment you look at the Bank of England and what they are projecting in terms of growth going forward, it is in line with most independent forecasters who don't aren't part of this uh, idea that you know Mark Carney is part of the global elite. They're just looking at the data and looking at business investment. Probably going to be negative this year. Consumers cautious around big ticket purchases. You know there are reasons to be very concerned that it won't make to take much to tip the UK economy into a recession and. Therefore, the added uncertainty that Brexit brings is just making that a more likely outcome. Okay, well, we are running out of time. Um, So I would like to hear from you, Robert, on what happens now, between now and March the 29th. What needs to happen for you, as you say, for for the pound to go up, for to see UK growth? What needs to happen? What agreement needs to happen? Well, the the pound would be on an upward cycle, I believe, after we leave the European Union and, of course, everything... For that to happen, what agreement needs to be in place? Well, it was about a year ago now that I was on uh, IGTV and I said there would be an agreement and they would uh, fudge something together and... determine what it means afterwards. There will be, I think, some agreement between uh, the UK and the European Union. Uh, they, they what will... does it look like, do you think? It would look rather, like, unfortunately, rather like the current withdrawal agreement, but with uh, various sort of attached text sort of clarifying the backstop. But unfortunately, it looks. I think there's a very good chance that uh, L- Labour MPs will defect and vote with uh, vote with the government uh, and that means we'd be paying £39 billion to the European Union for the sake of uh, us being continually uh, essentially governed by the European Court of Justice in many areas and not having our tra- independent trade policy going forward. Any, that, of, that any it... of Corbyn's conditions you think will be in there? Well, I, <laughs> if Corbyn could have his real conditions, we'd be outside, he'd be, he'd be, he'd be a clean Brexit coming out of the EU without... That's not going to happen, is it? So, no, yeah. it, it does, doesn't look like it, but I, I think there is still, there's still... It's pretty much 50-50, though, arguably, or perhaps slightly wavering slightly towards a real draw agreement going through in some revised format. But if case, the, in, in the case that there isn't one, uh, that we'd still have other agreements that would, that would be able to keep things pretty much as they were, uh, in terms of terms of trade with limited friction. Even though the say. EU have said that unless it is what is agreed, then there is no deal. But well, uh, final... Th- fi- yeah. well, they, they, they've, they've already made other, other deals themselves on, on hauliers. So we, yeah. we, we, we were told that our hauliers wouldn't be able to gain access okay. to, to the continent. Well, now they're going to be unlimited for the time being. So it's down to them to back rather than us to back at the moment. Simon? Well, so I think I tend to agree that there will be a third text alongside the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration that will clarify some of the stuff around the backstop. And that will provide the air cover for some MPs who've wanted to signal their virtue towards a, a sort of clean Brexit, subsequently backing the withdrawal agreement, because that is probably the only conceivable way that Parliament will vote through an agreement to leave on the 29th of March. So my sense is that is the pathway we are on. The problem as I've been saying throughout the show, is that clarifying what Brexit actually looks like will be the years of legislation to come and the degree to which the UK diverges or converges with its biggest trading partner. I'm I'm going to let you finish on this, Robert, because I know you're desperate to to, to have a final word on it. Well, once you're outside of the European Union, our policymakers can put the British interest first rather than having to be told what to do by bureaucrats in Brussels and have our trade policy negotiated by people we haven't elected, people who are not putting the UK's interests first, which is why we have uh, have kind of all kinds of tariffs on oranges you know, to protect Spanish uh, orange growers. It, it, it doesn't, the trade policy of the European Union doesn't work for the UK, it never has. We can do a lot better ourselves. OK, we're going to leave it there. Um, you two disagreeing, just like Corbyn and May disagree and May and Brussels disagree. Thanks uh, to both of my guests, Simon French from Pamela Gordon and Robert Alds, director of the Bruges Group.